All right, so it's two o'clock on my watch, so I think we'll go ahead and get ourselves going. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to our webinar that we have based on uh, working through our SIN core. We do have some interesting updates, as you can imagine. Most everything is evolutionary, and Buki is no different. We want to bring new products to the market and ideas that will be helpful to the different laboratories and different systems that are out there. Okay, so first thing we'll do is we're going to go through a bit of a discussion. Uh, we're going to go and uh, have an outline of uh, the five, probably five different things that I have listed here that we're going to talk about. First, I'm going to introduce both Donald and me. And uh, oh, what did we do? Went to the wrong one. There we go. Donald and me. Um, Donald is a product specialist with Buki. He's been working with Buki over a year now, and uh, he does laboratory and industrial evaporation. So one of the things that's going to be a highlight there is when we get to the method development itself. He uh, did a lot of the footwork, let me tell you. And uh, there he is in his home state, if you want to see. And uh, then there's me, and I'm market manager for Buki in the arenas of food and beverage, feed and environmental. So I kind of oversee a lot of the different things that go on, the different activities in those industries. All right, if you're in from a different industry, um, this still applies to you, and we'll talk about where and how this can apply to you as well. All right, the next part of the thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the instrument and describe it a little bit. And I'm gonna have a couple of app notes, and let me apologize in advance, uh, but the literature itself is gonna be a part of the attachments for you guys to be able to download. But the print is a little bit small, but I'm gonna move through that kind of quickly anyway, just through an app note, just so that way you guys can see exactly what we're doing with, the, with what the information that we have available. And the next thing is Donald's going to take over and he's going to describe to the, you the operation of how we did the product improvements and the different features of the instrument itself. Um, at that point, we'll run through a quick recap and a question and answer. I tend not to be long-winded, so if you'll stay with us, it won't be that long. We'll only be about 15, maybe 20 minutes before we open the floor for comments and questions. All right, and by all means to everybody, um, we're going to work our way through the, the uh, PowerPoint for the discussion. What we're going to do is hold the questions and answer them all as we get them at, at the end of the session. Okay, and questions tend to lead to more questions. So we want to maintain our flow and make sure that we have everything moving smoothly for you. Okay, so with that being said, what we're going to do is I wanted to show you the instrument itself. If you take a look in your lower left hand screen, what you'll see is the instrument configuration. What we have on the left side is uh, the Syncore itself, a condensation system in the middle, and our vacuum pump. The chiller is not pictured, but that's pretty much all of the um, components of the instrument itself. And uh, again, Donald described the function and how it all works here in just a little bit. Okay, so first things first, as we go through, this is the application note that I was talking about before. Basically, it describes all of the parallel evaporation solutions that Buki has. Um, there's a Syncor Polyvap, Syncor um, Analyst, which is the one we're describing today, and then the Multivapor. Um, the couple of slides that I pulled out from the Syncor are for the Syncor Analyst itself. And again, one of the primary things is we're going to final volume with the system. If you need to go to residue, either the Multivapor for low boiling point solvents will work, but with your medium to high boiling point solvents, the one thing we'll do is we'll move toward the uh, Syncor polyvac. Okay, the whole idea of this particular system, though, is um, concentration to final volume. Okay, we do cross the various industries. Um, they're all highlighted in red. That concentration to final volume is definitely something that goes um, virtually throughout the analytical world. Most of the time it's to GC, GCMS, but there are other things that can be involved as well. Okay. And then lastly, the different things that we can do. The one thing, if you look at the application portion, you can see that we can go to a final volume of 0.3, 1, and 3 milliliters. Those graduations are all uh, pretty standard within the Syncor Analyst system itself. Okay. With that, we have a 4, 6, and 12 position racks. And we can go from five to 500 milliliters. Uh, if you go much, if you start off with much lower than that, what's the point of the concentration? But we can get pretty good, pretty far up into the high volume for those who need it. 
okay? The way that we uh, grade things, our degree of automation is, um, well, we call it a two because it's not a push button and fully walk away, but it's pretty close to it as opposed to some other systems that we have that we can physically uh, monitor from a computer terminal. This is not the same way. All right. And then the evaporation performance, the whole idea of what we're talking about here is it's really good and it gets us where we need to be. All right. So when we look at the system itself, we see the former rack. Oh, and I need to start the video. Never mind. Let's do that. Okay. So Donald is actually starting the video from here. Um, we're going to be advancing to a couple of set points that I have uh, just kind of give you an idea of what we are going to do as far as um, the video to make it available to people. It is a 30 minute video. We are going to cut through it fairly quickly though. All right. Okay. So going back to the former rack system that we have here, the one thing that we see is uh, we're going to go out with the old and we're going to bring in a new with that new we have a new design. And the one thing that you notice here is we now have all the wells connected. Okay, that becomes a very important part. And why? Because, well, first of all, it makes the filling very easy, very simple. So that way you can fill from only one position. To those of you who saw the warm up video that we built, the little teaser that we had, you saw us pouring in from one specific spot. Remember the water is there much like with a rotor vapor to complete the heat exchange from the block to the glass to the sample, okay? And the basin rim also provides us a water level control. So now uh, we're able to fill and also maintain. And the one thing that we're looking for is that consistency in the heat transfer. With this new design, all 12 wells connected, our water level is all the same. And so therefore the heat is consistent across all 12 positions. All right, and finally, um, again, we have three different versions of the analyst, uh, three different racks. You, you see the crystal racks that we have for the, the four and the six position systems. And then of course, the one that we're demonstrating today, which is a 12 position system. They are interchangeable and we do have a video available that will show you uh, in about two minutes how you can exchange from one rack to another. That won't be covered today, but just know that it's available. All right. And so with that, I bring you Donald to discuss um, the chemistry in operation. Hello, everyone. Um, as Jerry said, my name is Donald, and uh, I'll be covering the workflow and then a couple other uh, characteristics, parameters about the process that help for optimization, as well as some things that we did to optimize some different methods that we had in our inventory. Um, so as you look at this slide here, <clears throat> the, the Syncor com comes into place because it's a concentration step. It's used for concentrating, especially after an extraction method. Um, after you extract uh, whatever um, target chemical that you're going after inside of your product, you have to concentrate it down after the process so that you can analyze it or do whatever you need to do. Um, so the Syncor is a distillation process. So in the past, and actually even currently today, um, people still do nitrogen blowdown or the Caderna Danish method, which are evaporation methods. But the key thing that they don't do is condensate. So all those vapors that you're removing off of your sample, they're just going out into hopefully your fume hood, and which uh, inevitably might even be going out into the atmosphere. With the Syncor unit, since it's a distillation process, you're evaporating the solvent off and you're also condensing it back down into the liquid form so that you can collect it and possibly reuse it at later. Um, even at, you can even do a cleanup step or to dispose of it properly so that it's not going out to the atmosphere. And another big thing with the process is that you don't need nitrogen. There's no nitrogen source when using a sink core because you do do this under vacuum. So you, there is no need for nitrogen. So you don't have to order a bunch of nitrogen tanks and it saves costs in the lab. Um, by re reusing the same equipment on a daily basis as opposed to ordering ordering nitrogen tanks um, you know every week um, so the big one of the big focuses for using uh, distillation and using the syncor unit is the vacuum source so it's very important to have a vacuum source because uh, you can re you can lower the boiling point of the solvent that you're trying to collect and, uh, you know, back in school, somebody told me that if you don't use something, you lose it. So what tends to happen is a lot of people don't realize that 
pressure plays a big point in um, trying to evaporate something. The boiling point, as you lower the pressure, you lower the boiling point. And the, obviously the lower the pressure, the lower the boiling point and the less energy you need to put into the system to get your solvent to evaporate. And that's where really where the vacuum uh, comes into play. So the advantage of this, as you can see here, if you have thermal sensitive samples, then you obviously you don't have to degrade them or polymerize them by introducing a lot of heat into the system. And you also speed up your evaporation rates significantly because you have to put a lot less energy into the system. If you do put a little bit more energy into the system, you can, you can really send those vapors flying over and really concentrate your sample in a timely manner. And then, as I mentioned before, the elimination of nitrogen in your process. If you don't need nitrogen, saving costs, and um, you get nice reproducible results as well because with your vacuum source and va proper vacuum control, you can get uh, nice reproducible results, but we'll get into that in the next slide. So, um, you know, following up with what I said previously, with proper vacuum control, you can create a method. And if you have a proper method, then you can get nice reproducible results and you can do everything in a very timely manner. So this is one of the methods that we created in the lab. So this is for DCM. And this is going from 100 milliliter samples to one milliliter residual volume. So we did this, as you can see the parameters here, we have a uh, platform temperature of 55, which is the, the heating block there. You have your coolant temperature, which is the condenser and the recirculating chiller that's connected to it. And then you have your vacuum cover, which is a, a heated lid so that as vapors go over, they don't condense on the glassware and fall back down into the well one so they don't collect inside of the uh the top of the lid and so that they continue over into the condenser so they can properly be condensed down and then you have the rotation rotation you need some kind of agitation if you don't agitate the liquid then one you lose out on surface area as well as you increase the chances of bumping so this is the gradient that we were able to, to establish while um trying to make a proper method for dcm and this, the, the, the methodology behind this method was to bring down the pressure low enough that we did not get any bumping, but we started to get evaporation. So the biggest thing that you have to worry about with any evaporation process um, is that you don't bump your product up into the lid, thus contaminating your solution and the, <clears throat> the uh, analyte that you're trying to concentrate. So with this, the first step that we have here, the ramp down from 950 to 650, that allowed us to bring the pressure down low enough that we immediately started to see evaporation, as well as getting the air bubbles out of solution to prevent any bumping from happening. And then basically from step two to step five, we have different um, gradient methods to further speed up the evaporation process without bumping. So as the volume decreases inside of your vessel, you can continue to be more aggressive with your pressure so that you can increase the evaporation rate and get down to residual volume uh, in a timely manner. And then the sixth and seventh step, so as you get towards the lower end of the process and your volumes get very, very low, it can be a little, it can be a little difficult to get those vapors to come off as readily because you do have your, um, the, the, appendage at, the appendage at the bottom of the vessel being cooled. So you wanna get the vapors to come off uh, right above that and there might be a small temperature gradient. So you do have to be a little more aggressive with the vacuum to get those uh, residual vapors to come over. But through, for, through optimization, and I'll cover a little bit more of this as we continue, but we were able to get this method down to uh, about 29 minutes. I believe when we started, the method that we initially had was around 55 minutes, almost to an hour. So as I mentioned um, previously, there are different zones inside of the Syncor unit. You do have your heating zones, which are the heating block that I mentioned uh, before and the lid. So, um, and I, I explained why, why those are heated previously. When you do have to evaporate, you have to add energy into the system. So that's why you have your heating block and then you have the heated cover so that you don't get any collection of vapors condensing in the lid and falling back down into your solution. Now you do have your cooling areas as well. So if you look at the picture, you have your cooling zone, which is in light blue. And so this is the cooling of the appendage so that you can get down to a specific residual volume without going to dryness, which you would do on the polyvap and not the analyst. Now, 
we also have the flushback module. So the flushback module, and I'll continue to explain this a little bit more, but it allows a reflux of the solvent so that it washes down the side of the um, vessels so that you, your, um, your analyte is being concentrated down in the appendage and not going to dryness on the sides of the walls. All right. And then you also have the cooling of your condensers. So your main condenser, which should um, condense uh, most of your majority of your vapors, is before the vacuum pump. And then you can also have the option of getting a secondary condenser, which goes on the back end of the vacuum pump. So if any vapors do escape the first condenser, they go through the pump and then they get collected by the secondary condenser. Um, now, this is a closer look at the cooled appendage, the chilled appendage in the Syncor unit, the Syncor analyst. Um, so as you can see, there are different hot zones, but any contact with the appendage is being cooled so that those vapors do stay chilled and do stay in a liquid form and do not evaporate so that your sample does not go to complete dryness. All right, and as I mentioned before, uh, we do have the flushback module, which allows your solvent to rinse down the sides of the vessel so that as your, uh, anal as your solution concentrates down, everything that you want to collect is actually in the appendage and not stuck to the side of the vessel, thus losing valuable product and not getting the results that you want to, and you do lose out on those reproducible results. All right, and so... Um, as I mentioned before, the, you do you do have the option for having the condenser on the front end and on the back end with just a regular condenser. Uh, usually the rates you see for collection are somewhere around 75 to 80 percent um, solvent recovery. But with the added addition of a secondary condenser, you can easily get to 95, even up to 99 percent solvent recovery. And uh, you can use that solvent for uh, you can recycle it and use it again for further uh, experiments or just to dispose of it properly uh, in a nice clean manner as opposed to having to go out into the air thus polluting the air and we do have different receiving flask sizes more standard you see a two liter but we also have the three liter but that in conjunction with the receiving flask of the secondary condenser you can get a lot higher solvent recovery rates now one important aspect that uh does get missed a lot inside of the uh, <clears throat> it gets chemistry field period is the fact of cooling capacity. So a lot of people, what they'll do is when they're sourcing chillers for any of the processes, whether it be parallel evaporation on the sink core or rotary evaporation or extraction or anything like that, they think of the temperature. Just because a chiller goes down to a certain temperature does not mean you have enough cooling to actually cool all the vapors that are going throughout your process. So one thing that I like to tell everyone is that however much energy you put into a system, you have to take it out as well. And so that's where cooling capacity comes into play. And you can look at any of the instruments that you use in the lab, but everything in, this, in the technical data sheets should have a, a proper heating capacity uh, listed within their technical characteristics. And you want to have a cooling capacity that is very similar to the heating capacity of the instrument that you're working with. Because if you don't have proper cooling capacity, what will happen is over time, the chiller will tend to heat up. So even though you bump it down to negative 20 degrees, after about 10 minutes, you'll see it go to uh, you know, five degrees C or 10 degrees C, and then you won't be getting proper condensation of all the vapors inside of your system. So for parallel evaporation for the Syncor, we recommend our F308 model, which will give you proper adequate cooling of your system without with minimum amount of vapors going over, you know, through your pump and into the secondary condenser. Next, uh, I want to touch on is the vortex movement. Um, so it's very important that you are able to agitate the surface of your liquid. One, as it goes uh, around in a circular motion, it does increase the surface area for evaporation to occur. As we all know, evaporation only occurs at the surface of a liquid. So as you agitate it, 
you break the surface tension, so you allow those vapors to come off a lot easier, and you create a lot more surface for evaporation to occur. And the uh, Syncor can go from zero to 300 RPM if needed. And depending on the application, you can uh, easily adjust the agitation to your specific needs. And the last thing that I want to touch on is the PTFE stir bar. So when we were developing the method and you know cutting the method from 55 to 30 minutes, one thing that played a big part was using the stir bar. So the stir bar actually added a layer of, uh, you know, added more surface for boiling to actually occur, and it significantly prevented the solution inside the vessels from bumping. Now you can do this with boiling chips as well, but if you're going to be using the Syncor Analyst, it's imperative that you find a, a stir bar that is big enough that it does not fit inside of the appendage. Otherwise, when you go to look at your um, residual volume after the run has completed, you won't get the results that you expected because since the stir bar is actually inside of the appendage, you're getting less volume than you would typically expect. So it's very important that the stir bar doesn't fit inside the appendage if you are going to be using a stir bar with this Syncor Analyst. And we do have one picture here. This is what we used. Uh, it's a football shaped type stir bar. And it worked very well because it allowed the stir bar free motion inside the vessel to prevent uh, you know, any scratching of the glass, nice smooth um, rotation and uh, movement around the, the bottom of the vessel so that we could get nice good uh, evaporation throughout the whole process. All right, and then I'll hand it back over to Jerry. Okay, so we can all see now that the one thing is, is uh, you do have to trust the physics and that's what we've done here. The one thing that we do is make sure that everybody understands that this system really is a balance, okay? You got your hot and your cold zones, you've got your vacuum, which is basically the brains of the organization, if you will. And then we have the orbital agitation, which Donald just discussed. And of course, the utilization of something to break up the bubbles and, uh, and uh, help with nucleation. It's a pretty straightforward kind of a thing no, we do not use any kind of endpoint sensor. It really is, uh, a, again, a trusting of the physics as we go through the whole process, okay? And uh, I'm sure there'll be a couple questions on that, but we'll cover that here in just a little bit. So as we put this all together, the one thing we wanna do is show you kind of the pathway. If you look at the black lines, that is basically just the vacuum. The vacuum goes from the heated lid, which actually is attached to the vessels themselves, goes over to the condenser and then over to the vacuum pump and out through the secondary condenser. Okay, the cooling pathway is uh, basically going to the, conden the primary condenser first, over to the appendix to make sure we maintain the integrity of those samples, the flushback module for proper reflux of the solvent to wash the walls, and then back over to the secondary condenser and back to the chiller. So pretty straightforward as far as configuration. The one thing we do need to make note of is we do not divide any of those lines. Everything is serially connected. Okay, that became a very important aspect that we began to look at uh, in former techniques. And again, when we were talking earlier that everything is evolutionary. One thing that was a, a, a big evolutionary jump, if you will, was making sure that all the tubing was serially connected. We don't have issues with uh, one getting better cooling than another based on its position. Okay, so in summary, when we look at the system, it is evaporation and condensation. It is not just evaporation. We've moved away from that aspect. We do collect 95 to 98% regularly, and even with low boiling point solvents like DCM, it does protect you and the environment. It allows you to repurpose that valuable fume hood space but then most importantly, you get good quality results. Okay, so any questions along that line? We're gonna go ahead and open the floor. All right, so let me expand this and questions. Okay, so first question that I see right now is uh, going back and looking at the method. Okay, so let me go back here. Let me bring our thumbnails back up. Okay, this is where I wanted to go. All right, 
the first question basically is asking about oily samples. Does this apply even to oily samples? And what I'm going to do is say yes and no. Okay. When we're talking about oily samples, the one problem that I see a lot of people is uh, with a lot of people is there's also water along with that oil. Water we do have to handle a little bit differently, but oily samples will not bump. We practiced it and we worked with it. And if you just have some kind of oil residue that you've extracted, you've got a high PAH amount or some kind of a gasoline, diesel, fuel, whatever the case may be that has a lot of oil in it, a lot of hydrocarbon, it still will not bump according to this process and this method that you see here. We did not test it to the fullest extent to 120 mils, but this, this profile at 100 milliliters or less, we did not have any problems with bumping where anything got into the lid. Okay. All right. Okay. It, the next question that I see here is about cost. Um, basically, what we're going to do is a better way to answer that is to get you in touch with the sales engineer who can talk about it. The one thing that we look at is we have to look at your process and your configuration. Okay. There's different accessories. Different people have different needs, whether it's going to be the, the 0.3, 1 milliliter or 3 milliliter final volume the volumes that you currently work with, the racks are interchangeable, so that way there, you may or may not need the larger or the smaller volumes, those kinds of things. So it's not as straightforward as, uh, as what you might think in uh, just how much does a unit cost, okay? Better question is to get the, config, get the figure configuration, ask the questions so we can get you the proper uh, fit for your laboratory, okay? So one of the next things that I see on the list here is um, the controller. Okay, when we went to the controller, the one thing that we have, let's see if I can find that slide real quick like here. Up one, there we go. All right, the one thing about the controller is, uh, yeah, it, it actually has won an award for its design. It's a wonderful piece of work and uh, so the one thing that you can do is you can actually see and watch all of the functions. Uh, let me go to the video real quick. I'm going to have to pause it. I apologize for it being a little bit small, but I'm going to blow it up for this part of the conversation here. Over at somewhere around, okay, I'm seeing around 30 seconds here. Let's see. Give me just a moment. All right. So let me pause this. I know it's really hard for you guys to see the screen. All right. So while it's moving in this, because uh, um, GoToWebinar doesn't do great with video. That's why our screen is a little bit small for the motion. All right. With the controller, um, with the interface that you see here in the i300 Pro, what we have here is we're actually following a set point. Uh, the 917 is a set point and the 937 is the actual at that point in time. This is about 30 seconds into the run. Okay, the chiller temperature was a little bit warm at nine degrees C, but it's set point is five and it does get back down to there. And uh, another accessory that we have on the screen here is uh, the vapor sensor. It kind of really gives us an idea of what temperature of the solvent we're pulling off at, the, at any given time. And uh, last thing that we see here, is we see that we have a, a graph that we can follow. Let me go further down and uh, let's take a look at a bigger portion of the entire graph. And uh, let me just, uh, let's see, 2715. All right, so bear with me. It's going to be a little bit jumpy till it gets another 15 seconds and there we go. All right, so now as we're approaching the end of the program, you can see that our set point is 278. The vacuum is actually 319 millibars. Our chiller temperature is at 5 and our vapor is at 17. So we're pulling it off pretty quickly and efficiently. And uh, if you look on the upper part, it looks like we have 2 minutes and 15 seconds in the 7th. Well, we actually added an 8th step so that way it would aspirate. But basically, this is a 7 position step method that we were looking at before. Okay. And then finally, uh, one thing I'm going to jump ahead here and I'm going to see if I can't reduce this back down. Follow along if you can, but what we wanted to do, something that I really wanted to get to, is show you the end result. As we finish, we just now hit the end, and um, in just a moment, we're going to show you the final volumes at the end of this run. Okay. 
So there, it's finished its aspiration. Donald is turning it off. And uh, let me go ahead and freeze the next one here. It's the same as the previous one, so no big deal. As soon as it gets there, I'm going to freeze it. And then we'll go ahead and go to a full screen. And you can see the stir bar resting in the bottom. So the stir bar is actually in the hot part. And no, we're not using any magnetism at all. We're just using it for the purposes of nucleation. But what you have here is you can see the res residue down at final volume. Okay. And we've got it all done in about 30 seconds. Oh, sorry, 30 minutes. <laughs> 30, 30 seconds. Yeah, that was pretty quick. Pretty quick. Yeah. All right. So I do have one more question here. Okay. Yeah, the video will be available. Uh, this particular video was too big to post to go to webinar. But what we will do is we're going to have a YouTube link. And uh, what we'll do is in our thank you and thanks for attendance. And you guys will be able to all get um, a copy of this video as well. So the four different attachments that we have as well here, the different handouts. Um, we have uh, um, the brochure that you received at the beginning when you saw the invitation first come out. That'll be also one of the handouts that will be made available to you in an email format. And then we have uh, the short video that we sent to everybody at the invitation as well. This particular webinar that we're recording right now. And uh, um, I'm sorry, the PowerPoint. The Parallel Evaporation Solutions Guide, which is what uh, I started the webinar with, and of course this video, but the video will be sent to you in the form of a link simply because of its size, and you can watch it on YouTube from any given terminal. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, I should go to the chat and take a look at that. Hang on just a second. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat. And I don't see any questions in the handout. All right. Well, if we're done with questions, then basically I guess we're about ready to wrap up. Um, I want to thank everybody for more questions. Oh, something else just popped up. What was it? One more question, but I don't see it. Okay. I see one more question, but I don't see the the question itself. All right. Okay. Can it control the tubes individually? I'll let Donald answer that one. Um, so since all the vessels sit in the same heating block, it is it's, it's you can you pretty much all the vessels have to be at the same temperature now if you want to control different substances inside of the different vessels you could do that only if what you're working with um are the the solvents that you work with have very similar boiling points otherwise what can happen is as you lower the pressure one of the vessels might bump while the rest of them stay calm so it all, it all comes down to what you're working with. So technically, you could work with different things inside the vessels, but in most cases, no. Okay. And one thing along that line, too, is do you really have to use all the vessels at the same time? And the answer is no. Um, we do have position blocks. They're just little uh, blocks to uh, cut off the vacuum. So if you're running less, then it's not a big deal. And do keep in mind that the vacuum is smart controlled. So you still pretty much can run um, down to as few as about five or six samples or a full rack of 12 and uh, have very good results without any kind of problems, okay? So. And the big thing to have is proper weight distribution inside of the unit because it is an orbital rotation that drives the agitation and you don't wanna throw that off of its axis. And you can work with different volumes. Um, there's a there's a bit of a window in there that you can work with like nothing has to be exactly at 100 milliliters it can be anywhere from probably around 120 down to about i'd say about 70 and still get good reproducible results under the same vacuum pathway 
the whole idea of the front end of the of the system itself when it comes to the vacuum is we're basically bringing down the body of the of the solvent first but that middle and polish stages are both the same so that allows us the latitude to have a variation and still be able to achieve final volume at the same time okay and this applies across the board to all the different racks that we offer as well so even if you go up to let's say the sixth position which has a work, working volume up to 250 milliliters the exact same thing okay all right so do we have any other questions All right, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start to work on closing the session. I wanna thank everybody for their time and their attendance. Um, it's good to visit with everybody. Um, we do have uh, um, a follow-up that we'll be sending and uh, make sure that everybody has any questions that come up after, we're more than willing to uh, address at that time as well. All right, thank you and everybody have a good day.